Well, uh, tonight we have uh, to share with you uh, handouts that you've got in front of you that I'll cover at the end of the presentation and a PowerPoint that we'll talk about. Uh, two different concerns, the winter moth and the gypsy moth. So let's uh, jump right in. Uh, this is the life cycle for the winter moth, which has um, now been around for about 14 years in our area. It was originally discovered by uh, Deborah Swanson, Cooperative Extension South, um, Southeast Corridor down in Hanson, Mass, when she was flipping burgers on a grill. They were pooping down on top of her when she was in her yard. So this um, started the whole process of what we were going to do next, and I'll explain that further for you. This is the eggs. Um, they kind of blend in very easily with the bark, bark crevices, stone walls, lawn furniture, uh, wood piles. The caterpillars, as they get larger, are, are easier to find. They balloon from tree to tree. They land on your car. They crawl all over your property. Um, and you can hear them pooping at night when there's you know, no traffic noise. So this is a caterpillar that gets to be about two, two and a half inches long. It's not as big as the gypsy moth, so it's, and there's no hair on it. So people can definitely tell the difference between the two. It's, it's quite easy to see. And when we first found them, we were hoping that there was, since it's an invasive, it, it came from Germany and Belgium, so this is not something that we've had before. So we were hoping that the native animal wildlife would fall in love with it and just eat them all up. So uh, the first week I was watching for these in Brookline when I, where I found it, and I saw a robin chowing down on these, and I called Dr. Childs and I said, hey, guess what, robins are really having a great time eating these winter moss. I think we may not have to spray. If enough robins come, they eat enough of them, we got it solved. And he said, well, I've been doing some research on this, and the folks in Nova Scotia and in New Brunswick and the folks in Germany and Belgium, they say your robins would have to eat several million a day, each robin, to be able to get any kind of control. So that wasn't the right answer, but we knew that our local wildlife at least was doing something about it. Um, this is the female, does not fly. Uh, the males are in your handout as a tan uh, kind of two-inch moth, and they fly around between Thanksgiving and Christmas especially on the humid uh, evenings about dusk. Uh, the Sherburn intersection with 27 and 16, if you ever stop at that light in mid-November uh, on a 50-degree kind of misty evening, that whole intersection is like Alfred Hitchcock with moss everywhere. So they're going after the headlights, they're fluttering, they're landing on the cars, they're getting run over by the cars. Uh, so that, and Bobby Childs came down and gave a PowerPoint uh, presentation at, at Garden in the Woods, and he said, I need to capture some of these moss. So we stayed a little late talking about old times and went out to his car and opened the door and the light came on inside his car and about 20 moths flew into his car. And I said, you're going to drive those back to Amherst and induce an invasive bug to Amherst. So you better capture them all before you open your door in Amherst and have a new infestation. So we didn't have to capture any local ones for him. He had his own batch to take with him. So um, that's kind of what we 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 had a first release site in Wellesley, which I'll tell you about. Um, and... Uh, Let's see, this is kind of where we have the overall infestation problem now. So originally the South Shore in, in, in this area, Hanover, Hanson area, then in the Brookline, and then all the way up the main coast, uh, southern New Hampshire, down to Long Island, parts of Connecticut, Rhode Island. So it's, it's now expanded from this kind of area kind of all over. And our concern is we don't want it to continue to get bigger, so there's efforts to try to find ways to, to stop that spread, which we'll talk about. So we've also got a Bruce Spanworm, which is a native bug that looks extremely similar. It just has a little, a little different number of prolegs. And originally, there was a lot of confusion with the entomologist that this was a, a Spanworm that decided to come far inland, but it really wasn't. So there's a lot of confusion where those two bugs are on the same property, which one's which, and they think they may even start uh, crossbreeding and things. So um, kind of a crazy thing to have a look-alike bug that's already here. All right, so this is the fly that the winter moth um, 
parasitism fly that actually kills just winter moth. So in Germany and Belgium, where the winter moth has been there forever, they don't have the stripping of the foliage or worry about blueberries or, or any other crop because the fly keeps it in check. So when they were imported to this country, however they got here on somebody's kayak that got shipped here from Belgium and stuck in the backyard and the eggs hatched and all of a sudden we had winter moth, but they didn't bring the fly with us. So the, the head start that we had with the winter moth gave us several years of it having a wonderful new place to hang out with all this new f food with nothing to chase it and stop it. So it took us a, a, a while to figure out how to stop it, which is import the fly. And then we needed money, and we had to go get people to go to, the, at the time it was Mitt Romney, and say, hey, we need 150000 a year for 22 grad students and some airline tickets to Belgium and Germany and some other airline tickets to go to the Canadian Maritimes, and we've got to gather up some of these flies, bring them back to, to mass, and we're going to rear a ton of these flies and start releasing them in different sites to control this thing. And it took a while to get it happening, and we got our first 150, and we got our first batch of flies, and then the next year we got another 150 and a second batch of flies and we started to do our first release and then they cut the funding. And we're like, wait a second, you know, this is just getting off the ground and, and we know this is going to work because they did it in Nova Scotia 70 years ago and it worked. So let's, you know, let's get the funding back. So we did a dinner party um, in Cambridge with one of our clients who said, I'll get this fixed. And she had a bunch of people there that I'd never met before, and we gave out these handouts, and we walked away. The next day, we got a phone call. The funding's back. And I'm like, wow, this is great. And we ended up ha going two more years, and then it got cut again. And we did another little evening thing, and it got reinstated. So somehow those things just happen. Um, I don't know or care for politics, but if we can get things happening and keep this rolling, which is what we need to do, keep releasing, keep raising flies, getting more and more sites out there, and then add a few more flies to some of the real heavy sites, because we weren't sure how many flies it took in our environment to find the, the critical mass for it to start to expand. So we didn't know if it was 2,000 flies or 100,000 flies in your start spot to actually make it take off. So the first site that we did, the first couple of sites we did down in, in uh, the South Shore and up on the North Shore and then the site in Wellesley, um, the one in Wellesley found 10 caterpillars per bud. And it was the highest number of, of winter moth ever recorded in the world. So that was just gross with defoliation of the whole park at Centennial Park behind Mass Bay. And we had big boxes like the size of this table with flies and we took a Petri dish and a tongue depressor, and we, we lifted each fly onto, the, tongue, onto the, the Petri dish with the tongue depressor. We walked it to a leaf, and then we coaxed the fly onto the leaf. And it took 20 of us all day to do two boxes of flies. And there was one grad student, I'll never forget, I went back to get another fly, and she had her head inside the crate, and she was looking down at the bottom, and there was one dead fly, and she was crying. I'm like, why? She goes, if you spent a whole year raising these guys, when one dies, it's the end. And I'm like, oh, my God. Whoa, get out of the lab. You know? So that was, uh, that was a trip. So now we take these boxes and we walk to the edge of the woods where there's leaves on the low branches. We open the door on it and we shake the flies out and we carry it back to the car, the state car, and they drive away. So now it's a five-minute release with two of us yeah. instead of 20 volunteers doing all day with a petri dish and but we didn't know how delicate we were they were we didn't know how, you know if if we, we couldn't afford to lose these because we had airline tickets to germany to go get more so now we have our own flies in our own release sites that we can harvest grow and then redistribute more so that is no more airline tickets to germany so um so that's the fly and um, these are some of the release sites in different years that we've been releasing. Uh, that Wellesley site, we now are at 98% parasitism. So we have great, great control in that site, and now we're hoping that it's going to spread into Needham, Newton, spread across Wellesley. Same with the site in, in Sherburne, Rocky Narrows. Medfield Line is another site that we're hoping goes down through Medfield, Dover, spreads across Sherburne, uh, hoping to do 
uh, Stoddard Park this year and hoping to do Hopkinton State Park this year. Uh, those are the two on the top of the list that uh, if they stop doing Connecticut, Rhode Island, Maine, and New Hampshire, we'll get some more flies because we did so many releases in Massachusetts and then we realized it was spreading into these other states that we started doing all these ones outside of town to try to stop them from getting further into other states. That's where this is headed. Five to ten years, Metro West will be all set. We won't have any more defoliation of your weeping cherries or your high bush blueberries or apple trees or oaks or anything. So that is very encouraging to see. There's teams of people at each one of the release sites that is going out from the release site, capturing 200 caterpillars at each stage, um, going maybe a quarter mile for each site where we collect. I keep these containers in my barn and I feed them leaves every day for two weeks and then the grad students come down and gather all these containers and they go with the 250 flies in each container and they dissect each one and keep count of how many have been parasitized, how many have not. So we're getting an idea of how far they're spreading from the release site. And then they're taking the eggs out of those caterpillars and they're raising them to flies and then we have our next year's batch of flies to release. So it's a tedious job to dissect thousands and thousands and thousands of, of caterpillars. I'm glad they're doing that, uh, not me. So we're just part of that collection, volunteer collection thing. So that's, that's working out well. So this was the aerial survey. Every year, Massachusetts has an aerial survey. We did the gypsy moss aerial surveys in 81 to 85 when we had the gypsy moss roll through. This is what it looks like now of, of uh, the heavy concentration of defoliation. So where you see the red, there are no leaves on those trees in those areas. So you can see that we've got a statewide damage. This is a number of acres that are there, and they say that that if the, all the eggs hatched that have been laid in 2016, that it could be nine times worse than this. Um, so that's the level of infestation that we could expect this year. 2018, they don't know because it depends on uh, the natural, the diseases that we have out there to try to knock it down. So we'll talk more about that. So the outbreak was a big surprise to me and many others. Um, the last major outbreak of gypsy moss was in 1984. So 81 to 84 was a big thing. Prior to 81, it was a regular outbreak about every 10 years, give or take. It wasn't an exact cycle. So you can't say every 10 years it will happen, but it was roughly seven to 12 years as we had a spike in gypsy moth. And what happened, uh, the outbreak this year, the drought in May and June over the past two or three years caused the gypsy moth to accelerate and I'll explain more. Um, so what happened, um, this is the, what a mating pair looks like, uh, male and female. This is the egg mass, which is two to three inches long. This is the, the young caterpillar, all hairy. Here they are feeding. Um, this is the chrysalis, which is the stage between caterpillar and moth. So I think you guys may have seen all of this stuff around town. Um, this is the time where you want to try to get your chemical on the leaf um, because the caterpillars have the highest mortality. As they get into the larger size, we see a high resistance to the low toxicity chemicals on killing them. Um, so this is the target time, half leaf, three quarter leaf, second, third instar. That's when it works really, really well to knock them down uh, without you know, annihilating everything else that's in your yard. So we're trying to encourage um, other companies to do the same, but we will not be spraying any caterpillars in that fifth instar because the chemicals are too hot. You're going to be knocking out the bees, you're going to be knocking out a lot of beneficial insects, and it's just irresponsible to put that level of chemical into the environment. So this is a heavy uh, outbreak of gypsy moth, and you've got everything there. You've got the the egg laying going on, you have the old chrysalises, and these are hundreds and hundreds of eggs in, in each one of those, up to 600 eggs in each one of those egg masses. So at seven le leaves a day when they're young is what they'll eat, 11 leaves a day is what they'll eat when they're larger, and they'll eat right through the rain, the wind, nothing slows them down, day and night, they just keep on, you're eating machines. So um, that level of damage uh, on this tree because of that many eggs is, is going to defoliate that tree in a week. 
and then they're going to be going on their little silks, drifting to the next tree, to the next tree, and hopping on a car ride to the next town. Um, they, they move very, very easily when they float through this, the, the ballooning stage. So um, this, is, this is a heavy outbreak. Underneath the branches, you find them in the, the wood piles. They lay eggs everywhere. So um, there you can see the little guys with the big guys, and, and they can you know, be three weeks difference in, in the hatch time. Same year, they just hatch at different times. So this is the history of it. Uh, this guy's famous in, in uh, Medford, Mass, for bringing the uh, silkworm and the gypsy moth together to try to make his fortune. And then he dropped the gypsy moth uh, out of his bedroom window in a jar, and it broke and escaped. And really didn't do a whole lot of damage uh, for quite a number of years, as you can see in the 1900, 1915, 1965. Up to today, you see it, it's got a, a much bigger range now. So it's moving. Um, and, he, you know, there's, there's uh, biological controls. They've tried a number of different things that uh, have had moderate to low or no success. Uh, the biggest break that we've got uh, over the years has been the fungal. Um, and we'll go into that. But this is the the outbreak in the 80s that most of you, uh, if you lived in New England, are familiar with. And this is where we are today. And if this goes up ninefold, we'll be up into here for 2000. Uh, you know, for this year and for next year, we could hit right where we were in the 80s. Um, hopefully, that doesn't happen. And this is what we hope will happen. Um, if we have the correct amount of of moisture, it'll knock it down. But this is how it, it, it expands. So each female lays up to 600 eggs, 300 are male, 300 female. Um, 299 of the female offspring must die before they reach maturity for her to replace herself. So maturity means going back to the moss stage and laying eggs. So they got to die before they get the chance to lay another batch of 600 eggs. So if all but one, then you, then you have a stable population and you're not having trouble. But what's happened uh, is the population will continue to double with every uh, consecutive female that, that's left alive. And now with the drought for three years, we start to have a tremendous number of uh, eggs being laid every year. Um, and this is, um, whoop, there we go. So there's a fungal pathogen um, that was brought from Japan in uh, 19, approximately 1989 and accidentally released here. And it turns out to be remarkably successful on gypsy moth. But it's a fungus, so it's got to be in the ground. You have to have moisture May, June to have it come out of the ground and travel around and infect the gypsy moth. If we have bone dry May and June, then that fungus stays as a spore, doesn't come out, doesn't affect the gypsy moss, and your population starts to crank right up. So when you have three droughts in a year, as you'll see here with the numbers, um, this is talking about the fungus, and uh, you don't need to know a lot about that, and, or the life cycle, the fungus. Um, but this is where it, the, the, uh, in the 80s, they introduced um, the fungus in uh, it's from Japan, as I mentioned, and um, the mortality is really, really good with a large population of gypsy moss. So that makes the fungus move faster and better. The low population, the fungus doesn't work as well, and that's when we rely on the mice, the chipmunks, and the rabbits to eat the eggs that are within their reach. So the stone walls, the lower stems, uh, the wood piles, the foundations of the house, that's where the mice will go in. Especially if you have a high acorn crop, those ground feeders, their populations come up and they really like the taste of the gypsy moth eggs, so they go hunting around and eat them up. If there's the level of egg masses that we see now, there's just not enough of those ground feeders around to make a difference. And we have a lot of eggs that are laid 40, 50, 60 feet up on the underside of branches that they just can't get up there and get because they've got more than they can consume just close to the ground. So that works when there's low populations closer to the ground. So prior to 89, there was a low density of gypsy moth population dynamics and were maintained by the acorn population and the ground feeders. And then the pathogens uh, worked with the rainfall May and June. And now we've got the outbreaks 
Um, with the drought issue in May and June in 2016, we, we, we broke records. Most of you don't know, but all the way back to the 1860s, we have weather records, and this was the driest year ever going back to 1860s. So really, really difficult to get fungus to come out of the ground and find the gypsy moth and make a difference when we don't have that rainfall. So this gives you a sense of where we were 2013. This is how many inches you had for May and June. Um, and then this is the drought kicking in. Um, and we're just not getting it to work. So, um, and the entomologists really didn't see this coming. So um, it kind of snuck up on them and like, oh my God, now we have this massive outbreak. What we're also seeing is when you have the drought and then you have winter moth eating the foliage of the trees, the new set of leaves starting to come out again after the winter moth has gone into the ground for the summer, the gypsy moths are then hatching, emerging, coming up, and they're eating those quarter inch new leaves that are coming out as a second batch. So the trees cash in their 401k, they make a second set of leaves, and the gypsy moth marches up the trees and eats those off. When you have a drought, the tree can only produce so many second set of leaves because it doesn't have the moisture to kind of make everything happen and push out that second set of leaves. So this year, we saw an enormous number of tree fatalities in towns that have non-public water supplies like Sherburn. We went into one property and took 40 trees down that were dead because he had gypsy last year, winter moth last year, gypsy this year, winter moth this year, didn't do any watering both years, and it was just kind of the epicenter there and trees were dead all over his yard. 40 inch oak trees and six inch diameter white pines. They ate everything gone. Spruces, no, no needles left, ate everything right off. So, you know, that's really frightening when we have everything coming together of, I, he's got a well. He goes, either I use my well and I run my irrigation system and I have no water in my house, or I have water in my house and I let all my trees die because that's what I got to do. And his well was so close to run and dry, and he's lived there 40 years. He goes, I've never had my well so low. So it's a real kind of whirlwind of things coming together to make this happen. So that was the uh, collection of slides for you. Now we've got some handouts that I want to answer questions for you about so that you... This is one that was written by Dr. Childs, uh, Dr. Uh, Elkerton, who is the state invasive uh, entomologist. He did the gypsy moth thing in the 80s. He's been there over 40 years. This is the best written document on gypsy moth. It'll give you all kinds of extra information in great detail. So this is a wonderful document. He wrote this last fall. So this is a really, really great, helpful uh, document for you. Uh, this is the quick and dirty gypsy moth sheet. This one here just kind of gives you what DCR puts out as a, as a quick publication. This is the winter moth publication for you. And then you have another publication on winter moth. I don't have another copy up here that was written in 2010 uh, in great detail to talk about our release program and how well that was working and the different sites and, and some more details on winter moth. This is the chemical uh, acelaprin that we're using. It's commercially sold only. I don't know why they don't make it available at garden centers. Um, I'm hoping that they will eventually. We talked to our distributor to ask him if he could put pressure on them to make it available uh, so that homeowners can buy it. Um, okay. This is no problem with bees, birds, groundwater, pets, kids. Um, it's, it's great. So. That's that. This is a handout on watering that we put together several years ago. Um, that's the best possible thing you can do to help the trees get through the drought when you don't have bands. So you got to start watering in April when we don't have the April showers. And then when the bands get lifted, if they do, water again in the fall to try to help recover some of the roots that have been damaged and dead you know, from the drought. So putting a sprinkler out there and two or three times a week uh, based on the air temperatures, which you see in the explanation here, put out a half inch dose uh, is the amount of water that is needed to, to saturate the soil at the correct amount to be able to make a difference. So watering a quarter inch or a sixteenth of an inch 
does not get it, the volume of water out there to m make trees come back. So you need to get deep, deep, heavy water dose. Hopefully this has been helpful for you. My card's there, my cell phone. If you have any questions that come up down the road, please feel free to call me. I'll do what I can to, to guide you in the right direction. Um, let's just hope we get some rain. That would be wonderful. There's extra handouts here if you want to take some extra set home with you. Um, help yourself. Extra cups if you want to uh, give to friends. So it was a pleasure to pass it on to you today, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.